All right. Well, there's a few housekeeping things to sort out first, so we'll do that and then we'll get started with the, any of your kids that want to ask some questions. So we'll get on to that and then we'll let the adults ask some questions when you guys run out of questions. Sound all right? That's if you've got any. You don't have to have any. <laughs> and firstly, um, if you could remember during the sessions to go out through the side doors uh, once these doors here are closed, that would be very good. Also, just uh, wanted to say something last uh, fortnight. Um, somebody brought in some tea or something like that into the auditorium and spilled it over the carpet which meant that the carpet needed to get cleaned and so forth and that somebody didn't own up to their uh, responsibility. So what I'd like you to do if you are that person who did that, that you might like to come to me <laughs> afterwards and at least own up to the responsibility because I wanted to talk to you just a little about responsibility and love. You see anything that you create, even if it's an accident, is still your creation. And if you don't take responsibility for what you create, then how can you ever deal with the underlying emotional reason why you created it? All right, so it's very important that if you do damage anything, or you, and this applies in your day-to-day -day life, if you do damage something or you do do something that something gets damaged, even if you didn't mean to, that you own up to the responsibility of doing it. Does that make sense? And there's been two occasions now where different people have damaged things on the property. Uh, that people haven't owned up and so we're talking about love here. You come here to discuss love and then we don't act in love. So we need to just allow ourselves to think about taking responsibility for our own creations. Now ironically often when we do that other people display generosity towards us and we often don't have to pay for the thing that we've done but the question I would have is if I don't want to pay for what I've created, then there's something going on there for me too, isn't there? Like something to do with the lack of abundance and all of those kind of issues, which we might have another talk about at some point. But I just wanted to raise that issue with you because obviously the more things that get damaged, the more we have to fix them up and the more obviously Peter is affected uh, as the owner of the venue by these things. And, and I w at least we need to take responsibility for the actions of what we create, personal responsibility for everything that we create. So you know how sometimes you go down to a shopping centre or something and then you come back to your car and just down the side of your doorway there's a crease there that wasn't there when you left the car. How do you feel when that happens? Like your property was damaged by somebody and somebody didn't take care, so that's one thing, obviously that's the law of attraction event between you and them but then they didn't take responsibility for what they created either. And how does that make you feel inside? We often feel angry, don't we, and, then, and, and upset that our, if particularly if it's a brand new car or something like that, or to, it just got damaged. And, and that's all part of what's the problem on the planet, if you think about it. The majority of us are still not wanting to take responsibility for our own creations on the planet. And that means or even our own creations of what, are, what is disharmonious in, in the environment even. We don't want to take responsibility for that. For instance, we get other people to clean up our rubbish for us, for example. Why do we do that? Because we don't want to take responsibility for that. We get other people like the sewerage company to process our sewerage waste. Why do we do that? Because we don't want to take responsibility for what's a bit on the nose and so we get somebody else to do that. And that's part of the problem that we've got. The more we don't take responsibility for, what finishes up happening is that all of us are trying to get someone else to take responsibility for it and then we finish up creating more of the error because it, it's out of the, the law of cause and effect is that when we get removed from the effect, we then finish up getting more emotionally involved in doing more of the same thing over and over again which actually grows the cause. So for example with damage of anything the more we do we distance ourselves from the effect of that damage what we're actually doing is we're actually making everything very much worse because we're not dealing with the causal emotion within ourselves that caused us to have that damage. Does that make sense? So anyway that's something I just wanted to raise with you. Um, so, in the auditorium, just a reminder, water only, in bottles please. Um, and that way, 
There's not much chance of anything getting spilled in here. No food. No food. So um, if you want to eat, that's fine. Just need to go out, that's all. Now, um, was there any other things we needed to mention, Dharma, like that you can remember? Oh, yeah, that's right. We've got a party that's going to be happening on the, what's it, Friday the 18th. We haven't yet outlined the general principles of the party, which we'll do over the coming weeks. We've got to have a chat with Anna and Peter about that, so we're trying to arrange that this weekend sometime and come up with some kind of solution. Anyone's pretty much invited, but uh, of course uh, the general principles will be adhered to. If not, then there'll be a police call made <laughs> and uh, as a part of the learning how to conform to other people's rules. One of the things that uh, I've been fascinated with with regard to the law of uh, free will is that many of you feel that I've got free will, so that means I don't have to conform to anything. Now that's not really true actually, because God made a whole series of laws that are part of the governing of the universe. And sure, you've got the free will to break them, but the instant you break them is the instant there's a consequence that's placed upon your soul. Does that make sense? So. If I go along and then and somebody, somebody gets upset with me and I decide I'm going to get angry back, so I get really angry, in a rage back, yell and scream at them, right at that moment there's a consequence on my soul. So while I've got the free will to do it, it doesn't mean that I actually should do it. Can you see that? And so sometimes when people come out to stay with myself and Mary on our property, I'll actually make one rule that I know they'll be very, very upset with <laughs> just to trigger this idea that we're allowed to do anything with anybody else's property that we want. And when we do that, what that does is it triggers within us this emotion that many of us have of rebellion. You know that emotion? You can feel that emotion in you, can't you? When you drive along in the car, the speed limit says 100, so you just got to push it as far as you can push it to get away with it, right? So it's 107, dial up the, dial up the 107, you know, I'll get away with that, so I'll do 107 instead. It seems to be a big thing here in Queensland about the speeding, but anyway. But the, we often are, what we're often doing is trying to see what we can get away with when it comes to principles or, or even laws that other people make rather than dealing with the emotional reason within me why I feel so hell-bent on doing that. So, so that's something to have a look at as well. Um, I don't think there was any other things. Uh, oh, I just should tell you a little bit about uh, how I'm feeling today so that you can have some commiseration for me. <laughs> um, that's not what I'm looking for, but I, I've had a shocker of a couple of weeks. Um, and. Uh, uh, because I'm, I'm actually now right in, right in my emotions about dealing with my unworthy feelings. So I'm really um, happy that actually I'm in those emotions at last. I've taken so long to access, but now I'm really in them. But the problem with that obviously is that uh, I've been crying a fair bit of the last two weeks and, and uh, also today I don't feel very good at all. So you'll have to put up with that today. And, uh, and if you don't want to, well... You can leave at any time, of course, so <laughs> you don't have to. I also find it interesting um, in a group uh, that we talk about, we're going to open things up to, ch to children, that less people come to the group. Now, I wanted to just mention that before we actually open things up to, ch to the kids asking questions, because why is that? What's going on inside of us that causes us to think, oh, that session's not going to be that important for me? For example, when we did the parenting discussion weekend, half the people that would normally turn up came to that weekend. Now, we, we go down this mile at the end of thinking, and I'm not saying you've got to turn up or not at any time, I'm just noticing the patterns, if you like. So the pattern is that that happens whenever the children are involved. So there's something there for us. There's something there for us emotionally. Why is it that when children are involved, we, don't feel, we feel that we're going to be less involved? There's something going on there for us. And that's something to have a think about because 
in reality, what I've found in the past is that the children ask the best questions. They are the least damaged emotionally, so therefore they don't have any emotional investment in the question that they're asking. So you know how many of us as adults, we've got an emotional investment. For instance, when you ask me questions about my life in the first century, for example, when you ask me those kind of questions, um, I can feel much of your emotional investment. You know, do I really believe him? No, nah, I can't really believe him. You know, I just need to ask more questions to see whether he's coming up the right answers. But even then, I don't really believe him. So, you know, you can feel that in the person. But with children, they don't have that investment. They come up to you and ask questions of why, how, whatever, all those kind of questions, right? They just come up and ask you. And they don't have any of this emotional investment in what the outcome is going to be. And there's a lot we can learn from that. So... When I say children today, by the way, any person under the age of 18 is open to the first, uh, is open to the first set of questions, all right? So any person, that, so the, the adults, um, you're going to have to wait your turn today till later, if that's all right. Um, so today I'm not sure how things are going to be. I've not planned anything. There's one other thing I need to mention though before we get started, and that is tomorrow, I've changed the session tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be a spirit uh, uh, mediumship and healing session. And tomorrow what I want it to be instead is um, questions and answers about spirit influence. All right. So it will still be good for anyone who's de developing their mediumship and healing, but it sort of opens it a little bit more about spirit influence and what's going on inside from a spirit perspective and how these attractions occur. The reason why is because over the next few weeks, the following week I'm doing some talks at Mackay which are about spirit law of attraction and spirit in terms of how spirits can affect your bodies and your illnesses and everything like that as well. And sort of, it will help you work through some of these issues. I know many of you who've been developing your mediumship have been having some struggle um, and having a lot of spirit influence happening and worried about spirit influence generally with regard to your emotional processing. So what I would like uh, to do is open tomorrow up so that you can ask those kind of questions tomorrow. So if you've got a question about that today, um, if you can leave that till tomorrow, that would be good. And we could put the question and answers uh, today about all these other different things. Um, can, oh, microphones, I've got to sort that out first. Who would like to handle mi microphones? Throwing? Thanks. Uh, is, you want to handle one side? And is that all right? And that's awesome. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. <coughs> and if we have the mic down. It's, uh, can anyone? Can it? Can everyone hear me? Everyone can hear you. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um. I live with my mom. Yep. I have two cats and one dog. Yep. I'm a young medium and clairvoyant. Yep. I have a bit of clairaudience, you know, ability to hear spirits yep. also. Yep. And um, it's just that when you said you, you were going to take a talk on the, about the spirit world, me and, ma me and mom, her name is Lana, like L W E N A. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that, it just so anyone doesn't get um, confused with the writing. But I believe in spirits and that, and you know, a little bit of, about and uh, and about um, Jesus and that kind of stuff. My question is. Do you do you really think your Jesus come back? <laughs> yep. Um, the answer to that is yes, I do. <laughs> but I don't think it. <laughs> but I, but I don't think it actually. Sorry, I I just had to say that. No worries. Um, it just sounds a little <laughs> weird. A little bit way out there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I've found it a little bit way out there too. <laughs> Can I explain to you how it happened? Would you like to know how it happened? Yeah. Yep. 
Okay. I had to ask. I, I like drawing pictures, so I'll draw some pictures, all right? All right, so if you can, re if you can think of the soul, so here's my soul, and of which I'm a half. So I'm the masculine half of my soul, and then there's a, a lady, this lady. Female. Over, female. See that lady standing up there waving her hand at you? That's Mary. That's the other half of my soul, huh? And in the first century, what happened was when Mary got pregnant, so she got pregnant just normally, no, you know, there was no immaculate conception like everybody thinks. Yeah, I, and um, she was visited by an angel and got Bethlehem and gave birth to Jesus. Yeah, well, she wasn't actually visited by an angel, that's the thing. See, when you talk to my mum, because I'll refer to her as my mum, when, I, when I've talked to my mum, she said she wasn't visited by an angel. She was just, she just made love with my dad, who was Joseph, all right? And what happened was they created in that process two bodies for my soul to come. We go, we should be back in operation. How's that? There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep, that's good. All right, so what happened was that my mum and dad, obviously, mum got pregnant, and in the process of pregnancy creates two bodies. There's a spirit body and a material body that's created and my half of the soul incarnated is the process it's called or it came to, you can think of it as coming to earth and what it does is it joins up with those two bodies and from then on starts experiencing life. So that was the very very first time I'd ever been on earth and this time is the second time I've been on earth so we'll talk about what happened in between as well. Right? So that's what happened to me and obviously with my soulmate at some point too, that happened to her. She had a mum and dad and I'll draw her with a dress, right? So we got my soulmate, she incarnated and the feminine half of the soul, which is my soulmate, she incarnated into the two bodies that became her and she became the person you know as Mary Magdalene. Have you heard of her? Mary Magdalene? That's who she is anyway. So that happened to both of us. Then we lived a life, and in my case I lived a life that was nearly 35 years long in the first century, and then I was killed. In Mary's case, she lived a life that was, uh, was around 60 years long, and then she died. And so when we died, what happens when you die is that the, the physical body disappears, right? Right. And so now you're a spirit, you're what's called a spirit, so you've got a spirit body, so this is me in the spirit world, and my soul connected to my spirit body, right? And there's a cord that connects the two together that, that allows you to experience everything through the body. And so then I lived in that place for a long, long time, 1900 years. Whoa, and I, I can remember that's those really years. a long time. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. And Sorry, I had to say that. But you can say it into the microphone if you want to. <laughs> that was... 
that is a pretty long time. Yeah. Um, I, um, <clears throat> and <laughs> I mean, how can I mean? It would have been hard to um, to come back, though. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that because we'll talk about how what happened in the spirit world. There's like these different locations. There's lots and lots and lots of them, right? And these locations, the, the term that we use for them in the spirit world is spheres. But you could think of them like dimensions. Uh, or you could think of them like areas of the universe that you can only enter when you're in a certain condition of love. And there is actually, it starts at number one and it goes up to 22. Wow, at the 22. Moment. There's 22 of them at the moment, right? So there's all that. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. On the top of the seventh one, there's a transition that you go through. It's called the new birth or being born again. That's the transition. And then you keep growing and growing and growing and growing. And then there's the 20 second sphere. The 20 second sphere is way, way up. And in that place, the two halves of the soul come back together again. Right? And they become one complete soul again. And that's, once you get to that point, you could think of yourself like you've had all of these experiences and then your soulmates had all of these different experiences. And once you get to that point, you can do lots of different things. You can choose to stay in that location if you want. But seven of those people who got to that place decided to come back. Right? And I was the first one of the seven to come back. And what happened was that when you come back, it's a very traumatic process. You go through all of these really hard emotions. And you actually, what happens is that you have to get born all over again on earth to come back in that way. So what happened was, myself, firstly, went through a process where my mum and dad now had a child, and a child was me, and then they created two different bodies. So now I'm in completely different bodies than I had way back there or even in the spirit world. But the soul is still the same. Does that make sense? So we spent, I spent 35 years on earth. Then I spent around 1900 or so years there in that single state. Then I spent almost about uh, 45 or so years in that state. And then I came to Earth, and I've now spent 46 years in that state. And I can remember most of those, well, I can remember all of those states, but I don't yet remember all of the experiences in every one of those states, although I remember a lot. Because to remember things, you've got to have the emotions of them. And that's why many people here still don't even remember things from their childhood because they haven't yet allowed themselves to have the emotions about those things in their childhood. And it's the same for me. So I've had to go through lots and lots of memories and it's the same for memory, for, for Mary, my soulmate, where she's done the same process. So you can see what's happened. We were born then, then we lived 35, I lived 35 years, then I stayed in the spirit world for around 1900 years, then, then we were in this state for a period of time and then we came to Earth. You know, this was a bit less than 1900, but you get, the, you get the picture, all right? So that's what's happened to me and that's how we came back to Earth. And the process that I'm going through now is a process of getting rid of all of the emotions that stop me from memory, remembering all of my life. <laughs> well, I gotta say I'm pretty impre <coughs> impressed. <laughs> Well, I'm not very impressed yet, so no, <laughs> you're doing better no, than I am. No, I mean, no, I mean, just how the way you said it, that's how the spirits tell mm. what, what happens to them after uh, they say it's called reincarnation. Yes, but what spirits are telling you about reincarnation, and that's part of the things that we, we've talked about at different times, but what spirits tell you about reincarnation, a lot of times they haven't personally experienced it. They've actually heard it from other people, but they haven't personally experienced it themselves. And what they do instead for many of the spirits is they connect themselves to people on earth when they're little babies, hoping to reincarnate, but in reality they're not reincarnating. What they're doing is overcloaking or obsessing the person. And in the coming weeks I'm going to talk about that in a lot more detail.
Um, do, do you think accidents can happen on the way to being born? Because if you, if you look at my hand here, I've got four fingers. Yep. Uh, yep. And I, I just feel like an, an outcast or kind of like the underdog, you know, being left out or being different. Yeah, yeah. Yes, certainly accidents do happen being born. But it's not the fault of the person. It's the fault of emotions that exist in the parents and the grandparents and so forth. So what happens when parents give birth to a child, what happens is this. So remember every time that, that a parent um, makes love and they, and they conceive a child, this is what goes on. What goes on is the soul gets connected to the two bodies, right? But the two bodies and the soul are all being influenced by the emotions of both of the parents and also by the emotions of the multi-generational unhealed emotions in that family tree. And so there's all sorts of genetic problems that come with held on emotions, there's all sorts of physical problems that come. And so what happens is even when this baby is right in the womb developing, it's getting affected by all of the emotions that are in the parents and the grandparents and all of the line of emotions down to there. And so what often happens to many children is their bodies became, be, become injured in some way inside of the womb while they're developing. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and for some, the, the emotions are so big that the, that the child actually miscarriages. Hmm? In other words, they don't ever live to be born. Oh, right. yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah. Um, what I believe when that happens is that the, the child doesn't act actually doesn't see the light to go from this to the spirit from the spirit world to this world doesn't see doesn't see light well what actually happens is the soul still connects to the bodies but because of the emotions that are in the parents and the grandparents and so forth are so hard for the child to actually experience the child actually wants to straight away die because the, the emotions are so painful to them. And as soon as that happens, the child often will miss a carriage. And so, and it, it'll miss carriage under certain circumstances too. Like sometimes a, a mother may have a soul, whole string of girl children who she conceives, but miscarriages. But the instant she has a boy child, the boy doesn't miscarriage. And that's because of the emotions that are held towards the women. And so it just depends on the groups of emotions as to, and I'm explaining it very simply now, but it just depends on the groups of emotions as to what happens to the child when it's inside of the womb. And so for some children, they have finished up having things like missing limbs even, and missing, missing fingers or all sorts of problems like that. And that's all due to some of these emotions. And the key is, if we can work through the emotions as a human race, then in the end, no children will be ever born again like that. So that's the important thing. <laughs> I kind of believe that about the, that thing yep. because I can't really actually grip things really well as this hand. Yep. So I write with this hand. So you write with your right hand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> when. Are spirits able to contact you when, after they die or before they die? Both, actually. People can contact you in any, at any time. So, uh, for example, every night you go to sleep, right? Yeah. When you go to sleep, your spirit body ex goes away from your material body. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I've heard that. Right. Now, in that state, you can contact any other person on earth who can listen to you, even though they are still in their physical body and awake. Right? And then, if you pass, then or you're, you're in your spirit body or you die, or in your spirit body, you can contact any person on earth as long as they are able to hear you, as long as they're able to have, you know how you've got clear audience and you can sometimes see? Yes. Yeah, but not everybody can do that, can they? You notice no. that? So they need someone to um, 
to help them. Yes, that's right. That's right. So the truth is that whether you're alive on earth but asleep or you have passed over into the spirit world, you can still talk to somebody that's on earth. Um, I think when you die, you're, you, you're actually sleeping. Like you fall asleep, <laughs> not actually um, dying like just like that. That's right. The only thing that changes when you die, though, is you can't come back into your physical body anymore. That's so right, because um, because I believe in that life after death. Like, I mean, I've heard a lot of different. Um, I mean, like the Egyptians believed that life after death, and I think that's true because. Yep, and most cultures believe in life after death, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. And I've, my first psychic um, talk, this might, might sound a little weird, but it actually was with my great grandmother on mom's side. Yeah. And um, I never knew her. She died before I was born. Yep. And I knew it was a motherly figure. Like yeah. your grandmother? Yeah. I saw it. it can't be Momo because my grandma is still alive. Yeah. So I didn't know who this was. But she, um, she spoke in a different language, Finnish. You know, like. In so, Finnish? Yeah. yeah. Like, like, you know how some, I think some spirits can talk in different language, in the language where they originally come from. That's correct. And um, I had someone else translating it to me, or somehow I knew what she was saying. Spot on. That's exactly what was happening. Yeah. So what often happens is a spirit will pass over into the spirit world, but all they know is the language that they were talking when they were on earth, right? And then they spend many years still speaking that same language because they don't know how to learn another language or they don't even think they can learn another language. The truth is, though, that spirits can actually learn a language in around five minutes. So any spirit in the spirit world, and you'll find this when you pass, you'll be able to learn a language in around five minutes flat. And wow. eventually when you're at one with God, which is an eight sphere condition, you can also learn a language that rapidly as well, if you want. But many of the spirits don't know that. So what they do is they keep talking in their current language, and they keep talking in their current language, and they just stay in their current language for many, many years. And then they need another spirit to translate from that language to the language you know. Um. <laughs> I think the reason why I was able to understand what my great-grandma was speaking to me, because I'm half Finnish, yeah. half English. Yeah. And um, I think, and um, I, can, I, 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 I can speak a few different other languages, yeah. but Finnish has um, always been my kind of way of thinking it's a good language, even though I can't understand it all the time. <laughs> yep. And the reason why you think it's a good language is because some, some of your parents, your grandparents and great-grandparents, are with you quite a lot. Yeah. And they think it's a good language. And so what they do is they give you the feeling, yeah, that's a good language. And, and then you <laughs> feel it's a good language, right? <laughs> but there is actually in the spirit world, you don't actually need to speak a language. That when you get to a certain place in your development, you can actually speak with emotions mostly. So what you do is you transmit feelings to each other and they, you, they transmit the feelings and it's a lot more accurate than just actually speaking a verbal language. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it different with other people outside of your family who's passed away? Um, it's often different because, um, because you don't really know them as well or they're not as interested in you as your family sometimes are. So sometimes it's different. But a lot of times, uh, after a while, a lot of spirits get to, the, get to the viewpoint that they are just the same as anyone else in your family. And so quite often you will have, if, particularly for someone like yourself who can hear spirits, you'll often have other... And see. And see. And have, you'll often have other spirits come to you, right? who you've never met before, um, but, but all of a sudden they sort of introduce themselves to you and before you know it, you've got another friend, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one, 
one time, me and mom were going to see another medium. Her name is Lisa Williams. Yeah. Um, and I was praying to mom's friend, Fee, um, who's passed away. And I kept telling her, you better come or mom, mom will not be um, impressed. Yeah. <laughs> like I kept telling her to, to come, even though I didn't know Fee. Um, so this was mum's friend who passed away? Yeah, yeah. I, think the ba I think it might have been before or when I was a baby. Yeah. When she passed away, so I, don't, I didn't really know her well. And yeah. um, another spirit connection I had was with mom's cat, Susa. Yeah. Which, is a, which was a tortoise cell. Yeah. You know, um, different, a multicolored cat was... Yeah. And you could see the cat and yeah. you could hear its feelings? I could actually, <laughs> I could almost hear her, her purring. Yeah. I could almost hear her, you know how cats make purring sounds when they're happy? Yeah, I don't know how to make that sound. I that somebody else might. <laughs> like that. And um, I, could, I just, I could, I could see, see what, it was at night time and I was lying in mom's bed with her. Yeah. And this is maybe about rare, Two or, f two or three weeks after she passed on. Oh, uh, okay. Yep. And she appeared, and I just um, said, Mom, do you know there's a Zosa's lying right beside you? Yeah. What happens when an animal passes is they have a spirit body still, so they live still after they've passed on Earth. They still have a spirit body, so they live. And quite often what happens is they still feel, and all the time pretty much, they still feel attracted to the person who loved them. Mm -hmm. So if mum loved her, her cat, which obviously mum did, her cat will still stick around her in the spirit world until mum passes. Mm -hmm. And when mum passes, she'll meet up with her cat again. <laughs> That's what happens. Uh, um, I've actually um, had, ex had learned about two, I had learned about one animal death before it happened. It was the death of my dog, Dodger, yeah. who was, he was like a, he, it was a really um, quirky kind of dog, like, yeah. <laughs> it, it, what, um, but very protective of our dog, Byron, who's a Labrador, you know, a, those soft, those really cute, sweet dogs. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, what happened was one night, it was a year before it happened, and we, um, Two weeks before, or maybe two months, I don't know. Um, and it happened that I was in a dream, like, you know, asleep. Yeah. And there was this yellow light around the whole place, like everything was bright yellow, yeah. like maybe a spirit singer. And Dudge, or I don't know how I could, I could understand him, but he spoke in human language and told me that he was going to died. Yeah. Tell me the exact date also, October 31st, 2007. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He act um, what happened was he actually, um, it was after an operation. Yeah. And um, I, I hate saying this, but he actually um, fell off the veranda, which could almost kill anyone. And uh, and he, and he hung himself. Yeah. And I think that can happen to anyone when, when their brain is not working or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I think that Dudge or the, the dog's brain wasn't working really well. Yeah. Every now, can I ask you what your name is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was, yeah, I didn't forget. Um, Annalie. Um, Annalie. Annalie. Like A double N E L I. Yeah. Annalie Isabella Volcana. No worries, Annalie. So, Annalie, um, there's a little bit of emotion there about your dog still. So you yeah. Let yourself have a cry about that. That's fine. You're allowed to cry about your dog dying. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm fine with it now. I mean, I, I'm. <laughs> really, it's not like. It's not like a. Uh, you still got a bit more crying to do. Yeah, but uh, but you know what? what? Uh, um, 
You never want to be quiet, so... <laughs> Don't relate to laugh. You <laughs> relate to laugh. Um, I, can see, I can still see Dilger, and another dog I used to be friends with was, a, was Poppy, who was actually the same breed as my dog Byron. It's a Labrador. Yeah. And um, she, was, she was black. Amazing dog. And one time, I was talking with Poppy near the fireplace. This is at home. Yeah. And, um, and Byron, <laughs> I don't know how he came. Yeah. He trotted over. He walked over and, and just sat almost right next to me like he knew that Poppy was right there. Ah, okay. Maybe because they were like the same breed. <clears throat> the truth is that dogs can actually feel, if a dog has passed and they have a friend that hasn't passed on the earth, they can still feel each other. So they still know, and they can actually still play with each other. And quite often that's why you see a dog looking like it's chasing another dog. <laughs> and in reality it is chasing another dog, it's just a dog who's in the spirit world that it can see, right? And so a lot of animals can see, they, they see um, other animals in a very different way than what we see. And so you'll find this happening all the time where animals can see animals that have passed over. And so that's why a lot of times they play with them as well. And they go and sit by them and... And, uh, and often, too, they'll play with children who've passed over. So, so let's say um, there was a family pet uh, in a family where the child passed over. Quite often you'll see the animal start playing with the child who's in the spirit world, but from a person on earth looking at it, they look like, it looks like the animal's doing some strange <laughs> things, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then Sorry, just, just, just when you, when you said that, yeah. I can imagine a dog doing that, and that just sounds pretty fucked out. <laughs> that would look pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty funny. <laughs> so, so that's what happens a lot of the time. Now, Annalie, we need to give some other people a chance to ask some questions too. Is that all right? Thanks, you. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to clear that up. No worries. It's my pleasure. And uh, what we'll do is we'll ask a few others, and if you've got some more questions, we'll come back to you. How does that sound? Yeah. That sound good? Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so, you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, just uh, wait for... Um, you say when you develop your soul condition enough yeah. that mosquitoes don't bite you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering if everyone kind of does that what do the mosquitoes do? Do they turn vegetarian? Or? <laughs> awesome question. All of, all of God's creations are able to eat certain things and, and a lot of the insects are there to tidy up things that are dead. So one, the, the purpose of most insects is actually in this ecosystem that we have is to tidy up other things that have died. And mosquitoes are a part of that ecosystem, just like flies are and other sorts of uh, insects are too. But what happens is when man gets involved in the whole process, when the humans get involved in the whole process, we then have different things in our soul which attract um, these insects to actually start to bite us. And once we work through those emotions, those insects don't bite us anymore and they just go back to eating what they would normally eat. right? And this is why often too we have insects uh, often in great big swarms. The reason why we often have that is because man's in so poor a soul condition that what happens is that these insects multiply in such great numbers because they have this abundant food sources, if you like, which is man's blood or whatever other thing. And then they start carrying diseases from one person to the other. And this is where a lot of these diseases that come that are insect-borne diseases come from as well, from man's soul condition. But the truth is that when we deal with our soul condition, which is different than you dealing with your soul condition, because you are all permanently in a soul condition. His name's Soul, right? So <laughs> but when all of us deal with our soul condition, so we can all become souls just like you. And what we do, what happens is that we, we finish up uh, dealing with all those emotions that attract those insects, and, uh, and then they stop biting us. But you know what happens most of the time on earth is we spend half of our time trying to avoid them by whacking on insect repellent and you know, doing all these other things. And all we finish up doing is avoiding our own law of attraction. So we never get to deal with the emotion. So how do you feel? Have you ever tried? I went, I went out once camping 
And there was literally like thousands of March flies where I went camping. Has anyone been camping where there's just been thousands of March flies? Like, it is so uncomfortable. Anyway, so, so I go out to camp in the tent, right? And, and I go there to process some emotions, <laughs> which was the reason why I went out by myself. You couldn't even go outside the tent without just having hundreds of March flies all over you biting you. It was so uncomfortable. And, and what that did was it helped trigger me emotionally, like hugely, of being controlled and all these other emotions that I had. And so I spent the entire three days that I went out there in the tent, not going outside to do much at all except to go to the toilet, right? And, and the rest of the time I spent in the tent crying about the fact that I couldn't go out of the tent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that brought up lots of emotions. But, but often what happens is these insects come in these large numbers because man's soul condition, mankind's soul condition, had just creates this huge abundance for them that then they then just live off of. So none of these insects are really in their true proportions that God created them because of man's condition. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So they'll still have plenty to eat. And... Like, say someone was on Earth and they were in the 22nd sphere mm -hmm. and they wanted to go to the spirit world, yep. like, with their soul, can they do that? Yep. And, like, if does their body just, like, evaporate into thin air or...? Well, you, you can actually decide to remain connected to your body so you can come back to Earth and talk using the same body again. Or you can decide to di disappear your own body to actually make it disappear into the elements. It's really up to you at that level of what you choose to do. And remember, when you're in the 22nd sphere, there's two halves of the soul that are joined. So you could actually have four bodies connected to you in that state. So you'd be one whole soul. So at the moment, there's one, myself and Mary are one soul, right? And at the moment, Mary's got two bodies, a spirit body and a material body. And I've got two bodies, which is a material body and a spirit body, right? And all of those bodies can stay connected to that one soul in the 22nd sphere. Right? And you can even have more if you wanted to than that. You can actually create bodies as well in the spirit world. When you get to a certain level of development, you can create a material form and to actually visit the earth or visit the spirit world. Um, so you can do that at any time you want. So you, you could conceivably create five bodies or ten bodies and have all of these different reactions going on at the same time. You can actually have lots and lots of things going on at the same time. So you, Imagine you being present here, but there's another body that's a part of your soul, which is talking over the other side of the country at the same time. That would be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah. And you can do those kind of things in the 22nd sphere state. Um, I was just wondering whether your car had insurance. <laughs> <laughs> My car has insurance because I have to have insurance. Like, to register a car in Queensland, you have to have insurance. What, what's, the, what's the point of the question, though? Well, I was just, I was just wondering because, like, law of attraction and... Yeah, that I'm in the process of getting rid of all my insurances. So everyone that falls due, I don't renew. Oh, <laughs> and cool. what I do is just let it... But in terms of registration, because there's a law involved yeah. of the country and because I respect the laws of, of the countries that I'm living in, unless those laws directly contravene God's laws, I'll respect the law of the country. Yes. So if the law of the country is I've got to get a third party insurance on my car, then that's what I do to register the car. And in the first century I said, you pay back Caesar's things to Caesar and God's things to God. What that means is that when the governments make a demand upon you, because you love, you love everything, you don't hate anything, so you love everything, you, you do the best you can do without breaking God's laws. And as soon as God's laws are broken, then, then, then you don't do it. Um, and do animals go to spheres? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, is that reflecting your soul condition where they go to? Spot where on, they, where they've been, okay. Yeah, so, so for instance, let's say at the moment you might be, say, in the second sphere condition, let's say. Well, if you went to the spirit world and you had a pet, the pet would be in that sphere with you. Does that make sense? Yes. But then when you grew, you grew a bit more in love and you went to the third sphere condition, that pet would just follow you automatically because the pet doesn't have a soul so the pet can go through any sphere as long as it's attached through a connection of love with the person who loves it. Does that make sense? Yes. So they can go to any place in the spirit world 
while they've got a spirit body. And slaughtered animals, would they, they'd go to a low place, wouldn't they? Or? Uh, no, no. So, see, see, slaughtered animals are not loved by anyone on earth. That's why they're slaughtered. Yeah. Right? But they're loved by a lot of people in the spirit world. Right? So, obviously, they're all connected with different people in the spirit world. Or they go to places in the different spheres where there's whole groups of animals. Like, you know all the dinosaurs? There's whole groups of dinosaurs in all the different spheres that you can go... They're like, you know, some of the movies you see, did you ever see a, that 3D movie? What was it called? Um, was, no, it wasn't Jurassic Park. It was, it was a three, dinosaur 3D movie, a document. That's it, that's it. What was it called? Dinotopia, right? When you, and you, did you ever watch it with the... No, it's, you know, it's fantastic. They come, they, come out, they, they come out at you like, like they're real. It's amazing. Anyway, and when I first went to a... Three, have any of you, all of you been to a 3D movie? It's, a fa it's fascinating, anyway. But, but um, that's what it's like, living in a, like a whole planet like that. You can actually visit there in the spirit world and, and watch them meeting and watch what they do and everything. And everything's harmonious with love in the spirit world. So it's not like you're going to get eaten by one of them. And so you can investigate all sorts of things. You can even ride them. Right? So there's whole groups of children in the spirit world right, have dealt with all that and they ride their dinosaur around and whatever. And this is true. I'm telling you the truth. And, uh, and so when you, when you speak with uh, children, spirits in the spirit world, you get a whole different picture of the spirit world than when, you know, we've been talking a lot to spirits in the spirit world who are in dark places, right, in terms of helping them progress. That's a lot different experience than for a child who's entered the spirit world. When a child enters the spirit world, generally it's summer land that they enter. They go through some acclimatisation type of process in terms of getting used to where they are, and then they're just like... Then it's just fun, 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 like, you know. And they create all sorts of things. They even create living, whole living things. You, you, you know how you go down to the, um, like, uh, what's that place? The, the Wet and Wild, you know. You go to Wet and Wild and there's all these slides and everything. Well, they actually have those in the spirit world, those kind of things. But, but they're all alive. Like they're living. So you have all this amazing stuff that, that is so hard to describe that you can even make your house. Like many children in the spirit world on the divine love path who are not yet in the celestial spheres are making houses that are like slides and slippery dips and, water, and you know, water slides and everything else. Like they're just so, it's really fun. You can create whatever you want. That's the beauty of it. And, uh, and so it just gives you so much scope to do whatever you want. Thank you. I know. Sounds fun though, doesn't it? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so... Um, down here, down here, if we can. You got a question? Yep. Down here. <laughs> What's your question? <laughs> have you really got a question? You have. How does the Earth spin? How does the Earth spin? That's a good question. <laughs> Someone must have got it at some point and gone like that, eh? And turned it. <laughs> Don't you think? What do you reckon? And what happens? Is, what happens is that there's lots and lots of different explosions happening in in, the, in our physical universe all the time. And when those explosions happen, different things fly out from those places, and the, what's called a gravitational pull pulls them around and starts different rotational forces occurring. And the Earth spins because of those original forces. All right? That's why it spins. But in terms of me remembering everything about how things work scientifically, I still haven't remembered everything about that. And that's one of the emotions that I'm working through right now. So I can't answer really complicated questions where I can give you great big mathematical formulas of how the Earth began to spin. Does that make sense? Yeah? You reckon God's spinning it on his finger? <laughs> God's got basketball going on like, and spins it. So God's just showing off. Is that what you're saying? Could be. Yeah. So does that, that may answer that? It's sort of like, it's like when you get a ball and you push it on one side, it will always spin, won't it? You see that? And so it's the same, it's the same as these forces push it on one side or the other and that causes it to spin. What will happen if the Earth stops spinning? Ah, well, if the Earth stops spinning, 
it depends on how fast it stops spinning. If it stops spinning straight away instantly, like, like, just like this, bang, you would fly off out into space. And all of us would fly off out into space because we'd be travelling at 16, like, was it about 1,200 or 1,300 kilometres an hour or whatever it is that we're travelling? And we would all of a sudden crash into everything. So every single person on the planet, if it stopped spinning right today, right instant, every single person on the planet would die instantly. Right. But if it stopped spinning slowly, then that's a bit different because if it slowed down over many, many years and eventually came to a stop, what would happen is one side of the earth would get really, really cold and the other side of the earth would get really, really, really hot. And so what you'd have to do is you'd have to move around the earth because remember the earth's moving around the sun. And so it's, as it's moving around the sun, if the earth didn't spin, then the, every, every whole year what would happen is that there would be one rotation of the sun around the earth. That's what it would look like from the earth. You imagine that. So that means we'd have to get up the next day and travel 50 miles and then we're comfortable again and then we'd have to get up the next day, travel 50 miles or 50 kilometres for you, right? And then we'd have to then be comfortable there again and every single day we would have to move a bit for the entire year right around the globe and that's the only way we'd probably be able to live because one side of the earth would be too hot to live in and the other side of the earth would be too cold to live in. So it wouldn't be very good, would it? Do you think? Do you like living in one spot? <laughs> wouldn't, be, wouldn't be great anyway. So it just depends on what happens. And there are a lot of theories about what might happen in the future, but we'll see what happens to those. Is there another question? Why is the world changing? Why is the world changing? You mean the world changing or the people on the world changing? The world changing. The world's changing, okay. The reason, why, main reason why the world's changing is because the people on the world are changing. And the, the worse people on the world get in terms of loving each other, the more badly the world is affected by it. And we start destroying the world and we start doing damaging things to the world and that's why it changes. So you could think of the world like it's God's feedback system. Do you know what a feedback system is? You come over up here with me. You try to grab that off of me. You hold it real tight. Right? What you're feeling from me is feedback. I'm not letting you do it, am I? But if I open my hand, what will happen? You can take it easy, can't you? Right? So by me doing the opposite thing to what you're doing, I'm giving you some feedback. Can you see that? And the world does that to people. The world's giving us feedback about how we're treating the world. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> have you got another question? Does mum have a God and dad? Does God have a mum and dad? Does God have a mum and dad? Now that is the hardest possible question I can answer. <laughs> I, I still don't know the answer to that question. And I've lived now for 2,000 years and I don't know the answer to that question. In fact, you know what? There's quite a lot of questions I don't know the answer about and even though I've lived for a long time. So, sorry about that one. I can't answer that question. Do you know why I can't answer it? Because it's really, really hard to know um, what God has done and what God's history is when I'm not fully connected to God. And even when I'm fully connected to God, God allows us to discover things. You know how you go to school and you discover new things? Well, I'm in God's school too and God's teaching me things in the same way. So I can't answer whether God has a mum and dad. Sorry about that. I don't know. Yeah. Can we be what we want to be in heaven? Yes. But there's one thing to remember. The less love you have inside of you, the less you can do what you want. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so if you have hardly any love inside of you in, in, in the heaven or in the spirit world, if you have hardly any love inside of you, what happens is 
you're not allowed to do a lot of things that you could do if you had more love inside of you. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a good system though because it means that whenever, when we all get to have love, we can do anything we want. So when you get up to this place which is called the 20-second sphere, which is really developed, and you can do this even on earth, right? When you get to that place, you can do anything you want because everything you want is always loving. Does that make sense? It's always loving so you can do anything you want. So it sounds pretty good, eh? But it doesn't mean you do things that are unloving. You know how at the moment you want to have a lot of lollies, right? <laughs> you know? What do you want? I actually want to have a drink. You want to have a drink? What kind of drink? What kind of drink do you want? You, if you use a microphone so people can hear you. Soft drink, but I can't. You have a soft drink, yeah. Now what does a soft drink do? Is that loving to yourself? What does a soft drink do to your teeth? Rot in them. Okay, is it loving to rot your teeth off? No. No. So see, in the spirit world, there's no soft drink. Yay. <laughs> My mother says yay. <laughs> All right. So, so in the spirit world, I wouldn't want to have a soft drink. The fact that I want to have a soft drink when I'm earth means that I don't love myself enough yet. Does that make sense? Because if I love myself, I wouldn't want to take something that rots my teeth out, would I? No, I'd want to keep my teeth, wouldn't I? I wouldn't want to, oh, oh, oh the teeth gone, and bleh, would I? What does it look like? <laughs> oh, we look like that all the time. That wouldn't be very nice to even look like that, would it? Like, so, so in the end, what we have to do is just, we have to remember what's loving, you see? Do you like chocolate? Mm, not really much. Not much, okay. Do you like eating meat? You want to answer into the microphone? Yes. You do? Wow. Wow. Do you know what has to happen to actually eat meat? An animal has to die. Yeah, it's not, that's sad, isn't it? Can you see that eating meat, can you see that eating meat wouldn't be able to happen in the spirit world? See, if I, was, if I was in a place of love, I wouldn't want to eat the meat. Does that make sense? Yes. It's up to you what you do, though. You're allowed to do what you want to do. But I'm just illustrating how when you get to a place of love, then you won't want to do those kind of things. Does that make sense? Yeah. No worries. What more? will happen at the end of the world changes? Ah, well, that's a very interesting question. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Do you have any idea? Just, you can use the microphone and tell me what you think. I really don't know. Don't know? How did you hear about world changes? Did mummy talk? Did mum and dad talk about it, did they? Or? Yes, and I watch your videos sometimes. Okay, no worries. Well, it depends a lot on how much love people have as to what will happen. You think about it. If everyone was in a place of love before these world changes happen, would anything bad happen? Wouldn't, would it? Because we already know what the earth's going to do. We'd go to the place where, where we're going to be fine and the earth's going to be fine. We'd go to a place where there's other people who are, who are loving as well and everything would be fine. But if there's lots of people on earth who are not very loving, what do you think might happen on earth then? If things happen where there's not very much love. So You know how sometimes when you go, do you go to kindy yet? No? Grade two. You're grade two. Oh, right. Sorry about that. <laughs> grade two is not as good as kindy, I thought. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, you know, how you, you know how sometimes the kids fight? Yeah. yeah. How does it feel to you when they fight? You can speak in the microphone. I'm not really happy, especially when they fight with me. Okay. So, when they fight with you, it's not very nice, is it? Okay. You imagine being on, a, on, a, on Earth where everybody wanted to fight after Earth changes. What would that be like? Very bad. Yeah, it'd be very bad. So, so can you see that it's really important that we don't want to fight? Can you see that? Yes. Because if, if these Earth changes come along and we want to fight with everybody, we're going to create lots of problems. So, so after Earth changes happen, things could be really happy or things could be really bad. It just depends on what everybody chooses to do. Can you see that? Yeah? It's good. 
Is that the end of your questions, or you got some more there? You got some more on the next page. You come. You've come prepared, eh? What would happen if there was no food except animals? Can we eat them? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, firstly, if there was no food except for animals, then there wouldn't be animals because animals have to eat veg vegetation to grow. Does that make sense? So, so what you're asking is totally impossible. Right? There will always be food. If animals are alive, there always should be food that animals can eat. So therefore, there's always food we could eat. Does that okay. make sense? But if it's only like hay? Well, if it's only hay, I'd prefer to eat hay than I would to eat an animal, wouldn't you? Although, probably not. Have you ever tried to kill an animal? Uh, no. No, it's not. I've tried. I tried once when I was little. I was 12 years old. And uh, sorry, I was about no, 13 years old. I was, and my uh, father he got out a, sh he gun, a gun, and we went down to the paddock and we, we lived in a sheep paddock and we went well, we didn't live in a sheep paddock but anyway, <laughs> we lived on a sheep farm and uh, and we went down the paddock and he chose the animal, and he shot it, and then he asked me to cut its throat. Uh, and uh, I couldn't I, I had a lot of I still have a lot of trouble doing it. So I don't ever want to do that again. So I'd much rather eat hay than do that. Yeah, now you mentioned that, I think I'd rather eat hay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the other thing to look at though is see when we love ourselves we don't just get to eat hay because all these other food come to us like fruit and vegetables and all this beautiful food comes to us and in the end, yeah, like it, like it says in Anastasia, that's right. And, and so what happens is that we finish up having a lot better things than hay to eat. But if I had the choice between eating a cow that eats hay and eating the hay, I'd prefer to eat the hay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But it's up to you what you do because you've got free will. <laughs> this is a great question, say. So. Come on. How is God a girl and a boy? Yeah, that's a real good question. The question was, how is God a girl and a boy? The truth is that God's neither a girl or a boy. All right? If you think, if you draw, draw a big circle like this on your, on your piece of paper at one point, like you draw a big circle like that, and you do a squiggly line down like that, like an S, right? if you think of that whole circle, that whole circle like a ball of energy, if you can think of it like a ball of energy, have, you, have they shown you at school like a Van de Graaff generator? Have you ever seen one of those? Like the, it's like a big sparky ball that has all these sparks coming off of it. Have you ever seen one of those yet? No, you, you will later. Like. And you can think of God like this great big ball of energy with all of these sparks and things flying off all the time, right? But part of God's soul is what I call M, which is masculine, not male, masculine and female or feminine, right? What that means is that God has qualities that are like a man's, well, where the man is like some of those qualities, and God has qualities that are feminine that the women in the audience are like some of God's feminine qualities. And there's a mixture of qualities a lot of the times too. But God is neither male nor female. God's neither a boy or a girl. God's a combination of that. But, but sometimes I call God my mummy, and sometimes I call God my daddy. So who's your daddy? <laughs> God is your dad, actually. That's who's your dad. And who's your mum? God's your mum, you see. God's, God's, my, God's your mum's mum, too. So your mum is actually your sister. <laughs> Did you know that? that God's, no. Yeah, mum's your re sister, really. She is. Yeah, because from God's perspective, you think about it from God's perspective. He is you, and you're you're in a you're in a skirt at yep, skirt at the moment. So you right dressed like that, mummy in a skirt. No, mummy's in shorts. So we dress mummy like this. So here's mummy at the moment. She's in shorts. Right, right. Don't think that's a male. That's a girl. 
Uh, but both of you are children of God. So God has two children, so those two children have to be sisters. So you and your mum are sisters from God's perspective, right? 